So, for those of you who are just saying you're interested in evaluation, you know, maybe on Monday you are an old artist working as a sculptor, and on Tuesday you have to manage the budget, and on Wednesday you have to deal with staff things. Maybe on Thursday then someone said, oh, can you do this bit of an evaluation? And on Friday, if you're lucky, 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 you get to a little, do a little bit of your arts practice. Maybe, if you're lucky. And so, out of curiosity, how many folks in the room have had formal training uh, in how to do an evaluation beyond just like a two-day workshop? One, two, three. Beautiful. You three, there's experts in the room. Let's draw from their knowledge. Um, you, and how many folks have had absolutely no evaluation training whatsoever? Far outnumbering, okay? We're looking at about 12, 13 people. All right, so... Um, there is knowledge in the room, and that's one of my main themes here, yeah, is one thing I've learned about Territorians is you guys are a tight networked group. There's a lot of knowledge in the group, and it's a matter about relying on each other. So hopefully today we can share a little bit of that, um, but then moving on, uh, not thinking, oh, we're so remote, we're so isolated, we can't do it. You can do it, and you can do it well, and you can do it as well as anyone in Melbourne, in Brisbane, or as Perth from what I've seen. Uh, I just saw some strategic evaluations put out but in, in early childhood, um, the you know, Better Start intervention. That is as good, if not better, as anything I have seen. So the knowledge is up here and probably in this room as well. So here we go. What I want to say also, though, for those of you who are nonprofit workers, is dream big. Whatever your dreams are, have those dreams. Yeah, we call it chasing unicorns. Chase those unicorns. But you also need to be able to code switch. When you're chasing unicorns and dreaming big, go for it. But if you are talking to government and trying to sell something, if you are talking to a philanthropic funder and trying to pitch an idea, be able to code switch and really communicate clearly, whether it's your formative or summative, your outcomes, your evaluation, the impact, the difference that you're making, whatever it is that you're trying to communicate, really being able to communicate that well. So essentially having those two hats and being able to switch neatly between them. So, you want your project to stand out and receive ongoing funding. What do you need? A solid evaluation. And it may be leading into the project or maybe as part of a project funded. Now, there's something called Nesta um, out in the UK. They have these things called standards of evidence. Level one, basically, you can tell us what you're doing. Level two, maybe you've done a pre-survey and a post-survey. You see there's a little bit, that the kids are getting better at reading, let's say. Level three is you use some kind of control or comparison group. Okay, two schools. At one school, the kids got better in reading with our project. At the other school, business as usual. A little bit of improvement, but it was much better at our school. Level four, you've gone on and replicated that. You've moved it to another school, to another district, and it's worked again. And level five, systematized manuals, all of that. Now, all too often, people jump from level one to level five. Okay, we can describe what we've done. Now, here are the manuals. We're ready to go. But can you show that it works? And if you can't, you are doing harm to children or harm to artists or harm to the environment. So stop. If you can't prove what's working, but you know in your heart it is, great. Get some funding. Let's go out. Let's prove what's working. But if you actually don't know it's making a difference and you've been doing it for 20 years, stop. I mean that too. It's not okay. These are kids we're talking about. These are environment we're talking about. We cannot afford to have these things damaged or harmed. So a bit of a mission. So this place called Project Oracle, they went about making these standards of evidence. And they said, all right, dear everyone in the UK, you think you're doing something good, show us your evidence. So 296 people sent in their evidence. Now check this out. A lot of people said, oh, we're operating up at you know, level three, level four. In fact, why don't I ask you guys right now, um, scale from one to five, if you're operating at level one, you can just describe it. Level two, you do a couple of surveys. Level three, you've compared. Level four, you've spread it. And level five, your system, you're, you know, you're ready to go. What you have is solid. How would you rate what you're doing right now? We got a two, two, one, two. Thank you for your honesty. I did this somewhere else recently. There were like four or five at the beginning. I'm like, really? <laughs> Send it to me, please. Um, yes, yeah, so the UK found a similar thing. About two thirds of it operating at level one, the balance operating at level two, and six, that's right, six people doing that comparison could actually show that their project was making a difference than just the status quo. 
really interesting because this has been done again in the US, similar, they had 600 going into the University of Colorado. And of those, 11, 11 were actually making a difference. Now, this is interesting to me because city of New York caught wind of this. Oh, by the way, my mom's from the States. That's the accent and the attitude a bit. I'm sorry. Um, the city of New York caught wind of this, said, dear New York nonprofits, you may continue to do what you're doing. However, if you want city of New York funding, you must use one of these 11 programs that's been proven to work. Out of home care, foster kids, it was, it was all in the area of um, out of home care went from 15,000 to 10,000 within three years. All they did was adopt programs that work. And it was mostly with uh, family reunification projects. That's 5,000 fewer kids in foster care. Why? Because they simply adopted programs that worked. So that's why I'm on about, let's, let's get more evidence for what we're doing. All right, so. See the screen's all good. We'll move along. Um, for those of you operating at level one, and there were quite a few, we have, and if you have a laptop in front of you, um, in potter.org.au, in the Knowledge Center, we've collated all our grantees' learnings. Um, every final report that we ask for a grantee says, what did you learn? And rather than just being a big stack of papers in the back, um, we have collated them by program area and put them out. So a couple of examples of learnings. Some folks gave out uh, surveys, and this was a Sydney-based project using parents, and the parents basically, they found out that getting volunteers to do the surveys, they actually had to go back and redo it, and it cost them more time and energy than if they had just hired someone to do it professionally, or they said if they had just trained the volunteers. So if you're gonna have volunteers doing it, make sure they're doing it well, so you're not making more work for yourself. Couple others, ensuring redundancy in key knowledge holders. So whether you're an evaluator working on a project or someone else, you wanna think, who is that key knowledge holder? Honestly, we work in a human business. So uh, Greening Australia up in Queensland doing amazing things with the coral reef. The lead project manager there went for a bike ride, got hit. He's okay, he was in hospital for three months, broken lungs, broken ribs. Nobody knew his password. Sounds so simple. They, they went, it took them weeks getting in touch with the IT people to crack it and backwards hack it. And um, long story short, is that key knowledge holder you? Who knows your password? <laughs> um, who knows your strategic plan? And who are you training up to take your place in case you win the lottery and go to Bali? <laughs> or, you know, in case you decide to go for a bike ride, um, hopefully the former, not the latter. So, um, yeah, a couple other key learnings. All of these are here at Knowledge Center. The biggest one I'd say is capturing baseline data. A lot of people, uh, when starting a grant, they don't plan for that data capture. And so it's you staying up till midnight. It's you doing those surveys. Make sure in any budget that you write, particularly for Potter, you're thinking about, oh, someone's gonna have to work a bit extra to enter in that survey data, or someone's gonna have to work a bit extra to, to get that baseline figures and also the final ones. Make sure that you're budgeting adequately for that, okay? And make sure that it's from the beginning that you're able to capture it. And where you can, try to use surveys that already exist. Don't just invent one that's, there are ones. And so um, a good one was um, the example I told you about in Sydney, the one up there where they were training the volunteers. They said, we're measuring family cohesion, but rather than just saying like, my family is cohesive, scale from one to five, they use something called the North Carolina Family Assessment Scale, which asks these, like, it's just three or four questions, but because they were asking it um, in a proper way, they could compare it and say, hey, look, we, we've got comparative data here. We're doing something well. All right. So um, for those of you also operating at level one, how many folks have heard of something called SMART goals or SMART KPIs? Okay, a couple of nods, but not all nods. So again, this is also in, if you go to uh, impotter.org.au and you have a quick look at the blog, you will see these handouts. So those of you working on laptop, feel free to click on handout number one. And um, if you're not, I'll just check you through one or two examples. So a SMART goal is something that's specific, measurable, achievable. Yes, yeah, something you can do, maybe at a bit of a stretch. It's rewarding, you know, it's not something that's gonna bore you to death. You wanna wake up in the morning and get there. And it's time bound, so you have a bit of a timeline to it. So uh, we get grants all the time. I kind of apologize if this was from your application, but I kind of don't. 
So we have really good ones. Um, by June 30th, 2017, success will be defined as having captured all data on childhood cancers diagnosed in Australia between uh, 83 and 2013. That's approximately 19,000 eligible cases. So they've given us a bit of time and they've said, they haven't said 19,205. It's not so specific, but we get the idea. They're talking about entering in a database, including complete treatment data on all major pediatric hospitals with follow-up on mortality status to the end of 2014. And I just want to take a moment here to acknowledge that we are talking about children and children dying of cancer. Um, and a lot of what we do is, is serious business and human business. So while I'm up here talking numbers and facts and results, let, let's not forget the, the reality of what's behind that. But you hear specific, concise, you get it. They're entering 19,000 cases in a database. Easy, right? Let's look at the reverse to that. Um, vague. Each milestone will have the expected outcomes outlined so as to confirm the objectives have been completed and was successful. Possible technical difficulties that may be encountered in the process will also be noted. This will allow time to troubleshoot and look at alternative methods early on in the what are they talking about? You, we still don't know. I still don't know, to be fair. They didn't get a grant, so we don't need to know. But like, um, very vague. Yeah? Um, another thing, another mistake is people often think, oh, let's shoot high, you know, let's put a lot of jargon so we sound like we know what we're doing. To be fair, our governors to be on, they either need to have been a high court judge, a uh, chancellor or vice chancellor of a major university, president of one of the big four banks, a Nobel Prize winner, or, um, uh, or, or it's a special, special dispensation by the University of Melbourne chancellor grants it, right? And so they're smart people, but they're not always smart out of area. So somebody wrote in um, their goal was um, a successful outcome of showing idibinonone to be effective in the treatings of patients with OPA1 related to DOA+. Now that's all well and good. DOA dead on arrival? Not sure. But um, this too much jargon. The high court judge does not know what this means. Yeah, she's, she's smart, but she doesn't know what this means. All right, saving the world. Uh, the success of this project will be determined by the number of papers published in well-recognized journals, the filing of patents, awards received for scientific excellence, international conferences attendance, and election to the Australian Academy of Sciences. It's a 12-month grant, by the way. <laughs> so they were dreaming big, but again, too much, too much, too much. So what I would like for you to do right now, if you don't know the person next to you, go ahead and introduce yourself to them. And I would like you to just share one KPI of a project that either you or someone with whom you're working, if you're an evaluator yourself, has. Yeah? So just turn, introduce, go for it. Don't be shy. Okay. I realized that we could probably chat with each other all day, and I'll leave you to, to that at some point. But... Um, just in talking to these people, there's a grant assessor there who can already put on her grant assessor's hat and know, you know, what's going on. We've got folks from remote areas who are very well versed in writing art applications. Yeah, we've got other folks starting off projects just at the beginning. And yeah, the KPIs for that are going to look a lot different. And maybe KPI one is, you know, consult people, talk to people. Um, it does not need to be have results already at step one. And, and that goes whether it's Ian Potter or any other grant. And I'll try to get up around to all the rest of you as we have more of the conversations. There. Yep, oh, and looking at the, the folks online, most of them are operating at level two, and we've got one or two saying, yeah, we're system ready, good to go. So good on you guys. Um, we'll be looking for advice from you as we go. Okay. So. Um, also, these handouts, handout one and handout two, are available online. And another thing that I have put up there is a heaps of more examples of application, sort of the, the final report progress and the, um, what they said they would do in the application. So if you are a lecturer or teacher working in the area of evaluation or you want to get your staff more upskilled, feel free to work through some of the examples in handout two. Probably won't do that right now because I'm sensing there's a good, good volume of knowledge in the group. But if you feel like you were shortchanged afterwards at the break, come grab me. I can happily talk more. So the situation is sometimes the week before a pilot project begins or something, we say, oh no, we better put together a really good survey. We've got to show this is going well. Well, 
that's probably not the best way to go about evaluation. So thinking it through, the first thing you probably want to do is determine end game. It's easy to run fast if you don't know where you're going. Yeah, have a destination and go there. Involve your stakeholders. So uh, this guy named Colin Pitt did an international study, right? And he looked at people in Germany, Japan, US, New Zealand, all over the place. So in Germany, the definition of success was, does this meet specification? Tick, tick, tick. You have five KPIs, you tick off all five, you are successful. Well done. In Japan, it was continuous improvement. Is this iteration better than the next? Is this iteration better than the next? So maybe in, in year one, you got two, and in year two, you had three goals met, and in the next year, you had four goals met. That's a successful project. Not all five goals met, but showing improvement. That's a good thing. In America, it's a, does it solve a crisis? <laughs> Did it solve a problem? And I feel like this explains my mother to a large degree, but we'll get into that later. But it's, you know, create a problem, show a problem, solve it. And you might realize that when you're looking at international literature or American work, just the way they come in and go, wah, and I solved it. Um, that's the definition of success. They have to do that to succeed in American culture. Personally, I'm glad that my mom chose to be in the New Zealand culture, but I understand, yeah? So different if you're working with different stakeholders or applying to American foundations. You start off with the words, this is the big problem and we are the people who can solve it, yeah? If you're applying to a Japanese foundation, you'd say, here's how we're gonna continuously improve. Do you see the subtle distinctions there? Mm. So what is it in Australia? What is the definition? What was it? Let's have a go. Let's have a go. Nice, I like it. Just having a go? Would that be success in Australia? Ah, so in Colin Pidd's study, he found, it's, do I, is there a piece of me involved? Do I see as the stakeholder a, that I've been involved from the beginning? So that may be as simple as if you have an advisory council getting the folks who are doing the judging at the end involved in that council or committee at the beginning, consulting widely, yeah? Making sure that the people, the major stakeholders have been involved early. You do that, and whether you ticked three, two, four, five goals, it's not relevant, it, it, may, it may be relevant in your mind for your own achievement, but your stakeholders will think you're successful if they have been involved from the beginning. So clear message to the Australian context, yep, Drive yourself to meet those project deadlines. Make sure you're taking the time to involve the people. Te tangara, te tangara, te tangara. The people, the people, the people. All right. So um, next step, circulating tender. Get someone who knows what they're doing. And if you don't have anybody local that knows what they're doing, get help in learning how. Yeah, if you get a potter grant, I'm happy to assist you with that. We have um, online a, a pool of evaluators, but also part of my responsibility. So I just fly and hang out with grantees for a day or two to make sure, you know, that one person who knows Excel, let's, let's teach them and get them set up on those columns so that they can be gathering the data that they need. Um, or, hey, these other grantees over here have done a really similar project and they had some good evaluation ideas. Why don't you two connect via Skype or Zoom and chat to each other? So that's part of my job. Happy to help if and when you get Potter grants, but also in the meanwhile, use each other in the room. There is knowledge in this room. Yeah, there are people working at CDU as assessors. There's people who've been on the ground working with communities for decades. Draw from that knowledge, yeah. Um, finalize a proposal, and can I please say, if you're paying, and I'm sorry if any of you are external evaluators and you do bad work, but don't pay them all up front. Because if they do a bad job, you actually want to be able to say, I'm sorry, could you please, you said you might be able to do a cost benefit here. You said you would interview 20 people. I noticed you've only interviewed three. Could you kindly please redo it before I give you your next check or half the, you know, split it in half, but don't pay everything up front or you have no practical leverage as a nonprofit or a researcher or anything else. If you are that evaluator, sorry, do your job. Um, okay, next up. Reviewing that first draft, one thing I think I've noticed a lot of people are really reluctant to share that first draft with other people because they think, oh man, what if, what if it's not good? What if it's not perfect? But that's where, whether it's sending it to me, sending it to your mother, sending it to anyone, but getting that extra set of eyes looking at the draft. Yeah, you need that feedback back because otherwise, 
Um, you think you need to present something shiny and polished at the end, but if you're going at it alone, drafting it together, or just with the evaluator, you can get into your own headspace. Having somebody external take a good look at it is helpful. Again, if you get a pot of grant, I'm happy to. Um, and last of all, disseminate. And we'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Um, okay, so that's a lot of the level one stuff. Let's take it up to level two, for those of you operating at level two. Um, there's a great article by Google Evan Stern called What's Your End Game? It's a global development indicator that Stanford Social Innovation Review put that forward. Basically, they said, because they like making piles, that you can, um, you can have six different end games. One, open source, like Firefox, freely available to everyone. Whatever I'm doing, I want to spread that to the world. Replication, and that's something that we have a program called Job Support that does really good uh, supported employment for young people with disabilities. Um, they do an excellent job smashing the, the government job support rate is about 49%. They get 88% of their young people are employed six months down the track and beyond even, most of them. And so um, just replicating what they do. Keep doing what you're doing and replicate it so we help them to go to Brisbane and expand their services, et cetera. Government adoption, exactly what it sounds like. Maybe you want to pilot something and hope government picks it up. Commercial adoption, good example is pharmaceuticals. You, you know, invent something and it does save lives, so the pharmaceutical companies are helping pick that up. Mission achievement, something like uh, one disease, uh, they're looking to eradicate crusted scabies. The idea is when there are zero cases of um, uh, the most severe form of crusted scabies, then they can pat themselves on the back. They have achieved their mission. Yeah, there's 82 cases. Well, there were, now there's 114 cases. So they're working their way down slowly, or up slowly. Um, but uh, the idea being achieve their mission. Cunningly, they name themselves one disease. So when they get down to zero, they can start over again uh, with a new disease. Uh, sustained service is something like street, which is a social enterprise uh, for young people at risk of homelessness in Melbourne. Basically, they, they, the, you know, they train the kids making the coffee and catering and such. And that idea being they don't want government to adopt them. They don't want to replicate. They don't, they're not achieving. They just want to keep doing what they're doing, getting these kids employed. Um, they realize they won't single-handedly eradicate youth unemployment, but they want to sustain what they do and do that well. This is all available also on handout number three online gratuitous uh, Game of Thrones photo, this Ned Stark here. So in short, you, you want to co-design or design strategic evaluations that you or the folks that you, with whom you're working um, so that they can reach the end game, yeah? So you have to think, I need access to this right now. So um, just show of hands right now, what's your end game? Replication of a good project, government adoption? Commercial adoption, pharmaceuticals, mission achievement. And if you have more than one, yeah, you can use two different hands if you have to. Okay, we got a three there. So someone's looking for government adoption. We've got a six, I think, sustained service. Yeah, we've got a, a two and a three. So looking for both replication and government adoption. We've got the online folks coming in. Uh, with about five people looking at sustained service, four mission achievement, three commercial adoption, three. So it's, it's almost mirroring that many people looking for open source. Um, if you don't know at all, just throw up your hands. We've got uh, six, I'm assuming, because they're together. There we go. So sustained service, all different end games. But let me say right now, I was creative keeping them on the screen. Your end game influences your measurement, right? So if your end game is government adoption, you, you might budget. So we have one uh, disability support service and they budgeted, they said, we're gonna do 14 weeks. We're gonna show employment outcome in 14 weeks. Commonwealth government is looking for 26 week outcomes, not 14 week outcomes. They want a government pick up, they produce the results and government says, oh, that's nice, that's three months, but show us six months. And they had not budgeted for their, that extra time. So what? It, they being who they were, they stayed up late, they worked nights, they worked weekends. Is that the right thing to do? Nah, to try to budget ahead, knowing your end game can help you plan. If your end game is more sustained service or something like that, you might be looking at more of a formative project. You don't care if government picks up your project, you just want to keep doing what you're doing. Then it's almost business analysis. What did we do well? What did we need to do? And that's formative. For, for those of you who know uh, theory of change program logic, Yes, thumbs up, most people nodding. Then um, 
the inputs, the activities, or even your basic outputs, what you're doing, just reviewing that in a formative way and thinking, what do we do well? That's the type of evaluation you're most likely looking at. You don't need to prove outcomes down the track if you're just looking to be in your own world doing what you're doing very well. McDonald's is not proving outcomes. They're just improving their business model and they spread. Makes sense? They do formative analysis. They might look at where um, traffic is the most, but then they use that to increase the hours of those locations and better improve their service and businesses. That's their formative, looking at how are we doing what we're doing. Summative, if you're looking for government uptake, I pretty much guarantee you're going to need to show some type of solid outcome. You know, how many young people could identify all 26 letters of the alphabet by the end of your program? Fill in the blank what it is. How many tons of carbon were stored effectively? So that might be short term, it might be medium, it might be long term, but then your evaluation is more in that summative outcome space. Does that make sense? As a passing thought, a lot of times foundations ask, what are the risks? Uh, one hot tip I have for you is the risks are the arrows in between. The risks that you might input something, um, I'm gonna give you some money, but you end up not holding the workshops. Yeah, the activities don't happen. Or the gap between, so the activity, I hold the workshop, but nobody attended. Yeah, so the output didn't, you know, 26 people attended the workshop, but they didn't actually learn anything. Okay, 26 people attended and they learned something, but they didn't actually go back and implement it. They went, they learned, they implemented, and then here's the last error there, but the, it didn't actually make a difference. Yeah, and so just catching where your risks might be early on, you can keep that better. Is it that no one will come to the workshop, but you know the program already makes a difference? Or is it that you got heaps of people chomping at the bit to come to your workshop, but you have no idea if what you're doing is gonna make a difference. And that's where you're focusing your evaluation efforts. Okay, so next up, level two, still speaking here, who would you invite? We talked about how stakeholder engagement is critical in the Australian context. So just have a quick think, who's your next funder? Yeah, who's your next funder? What's their name? Seriously, what's their name? Um, what language or jargon do they use? Do you have a relationship with them already? So we're moving. Level two folks, I think we, we've covered a little bit there about having those, those um, connections with the stakeholder and planning that end game early. Yeah, just being a bit savvy about direction, having the map all the time to work. So moving from level two to level three, where there's essentially, the biggest difference is that control and comparison group, some type of counterfactual for you there. And everyone goes, oh, that's just too hard. Why not? Right? Yeah. I certainly said that when I was working with cohort of homeless. Evaluating the cohort of homeless young people in the program at St. Lawrence, right? To the track these young people and see if the program was any good. And they were like, yeah, but you, you need a control group. And I'm like, you mean I need to go out there with my hundred people and say, oh, it's so hard, but let's go do it. It was worth it because it actually showed the program wasn't quite as strong as it could be, and we learned a lot of things. But more importantly, I'm not the only one who found this. So these are three wise men from South Africa. Yeah, they uh, they essentially found that we've got um, treatment, and that is something. Let me describe the project first. It's a reading program. They went into schools, thousands of young people did a reading program and found that essentially the reading levels went up. Yeah, so at the baseline, there was one level, and then on my... So high tech. At the wave next time that happens, I'm sorry folks in the back. So at the baseline, they were at one level, and at the end line, they went up. South African government saw this and went, fantastic. It was only in three of their territories, states. And uh, said, let's spread it. Let's go for it. Oh, but because we're government, by the way, continue to have the evaluation. So the same three wise men went on to have the evaluation. And this is the control group in green. These are the kids that didn't have, so they went to 50 schools, I believe it was, and they had two groups of so thousands of young people, thousands of children. And now they had a proper thing for through the school year, half did the program and half did not. The treatment baseline, the ones treated in blue, had the same results, but look at that green. As it turns out, when you send kids to school, they learn how to read. Who knew? <laughs> no difference. Now, what makes me furious about this, 
What makes me furious about this is those are reading teachers throwing their hearts and soul and energy into a program that made no difference. Imagine if that number of reading teachers was using a program that did make a difference. Yeah? So I understand why a small local project can't have a control or comparison group necessarily. But, you know, compare yourself to regional data at the very least. Have a look out there and see, because if you're doing this, you're doing a disservice not only to the children, but to the workers, to the folks giving the program. They could be doing a better program. Now, there's a thing, um, ACE, the Australian Institute for Family Studies, has a list of programs that work, that have gone through, and it's on their communities for children. So you can, you can Google search and look them up. But it is some things like the Abecedarian approach and the families as first teachers. So you can actually see um, there are programs that work. Does your program have to be one of those? No. But your valuation then needs to be rigorous enough to get yourself onto that list. Yeah, if you're striking out and doing something totally different and you're beyond formative, you've done your first, your second, your third year, you're thinking, oh, I've got a business model, we've got a case, I think we're making a difference, just like these people thought. Reasonable enough for the government to pick it up. Very lucky they had a control group to learn not to continue it after the first year. All right, so that's why we should be at level three. So what help, close that door. What help can we give to evaluation resources? Level three folks. Um, I've got a pool of evaluators. Yeah, it's true, there's not a lot of people working up here. If you're an evaluator yourself and you believe you have the skills, by all means, each year in February, I say um, apply the Ann Potter Foundation Evaluation Pool, looking for more evaluators up in the Northern Territory. Basically, you send some work samples in, and I read, rank up on a matrix, and the really good ones get onto that list. Uh, so it's up on, available on the web as well. Um, quickly going through a few others, betterevaluation.org is a great website if you're just trying to work through yourself and learn yourself about certain things or processes. You know, for example, does an art gallery need a control or comparison group? Not necessarily, but what type it may be, you know, most significant change. There might be something that is useful and the resources, it's a great, it's a great one. If you do an evaluation and it's really good, or if you are a scientific researcher already looking to publish things, I cannot um, emphasize the, the having the standard object identifiers, ROIs. Yeah, those recognized object identifiers means that even if your organization or your university um, folds in 15 years, your work is still up. One institution that hosts evaluations and such and classifies them by issue, it's called Issue Lab. Why Issue Lab is useful? It's because a lot of American funders look on it to learn about best practice and who's doing things well. So if you've got an issue and you do end up with a good evaluation or a good research project, pop it up on there because you'll have that identifier that lasts beyond your organization, but also you can refer, if you're looking, um, UK funders, American funders often just peruse through these um, rather than doing their own research, and that's cool, yeah. Uh, lastly, each other. There's a lot of knowledge in this room. I hope you're realizing that already just by typing. Okay, so what else with level three? Trying not to work in silos. Have folks heard of the sustainable development goals? Yeah, vast majority, great. I won't harp on about them but why not link up some of your long-term outcomes in your application to goals that already exist? Yeah. Um, in some cases, some of the goals and indicators, so we've got 17 goals, you know, and a good, um, let's say 200 for a round number, indicators behind them. So each one may have a couple, quality education might have something about early childhood and about getting girls involved in education, about vocational education. Finding the ones that map to you, it may be that the targets are not in line. Um, you may be already exceeding the international targets. Yes, but that's okay. You can still use the phrasing and then put your own percentage in that you want to hit and say, you know, I'm, I'm getting this in line with the sustainable development goals. Why reinvent the wheel? Because then you can be using surveys and you can be using comparisons and other things from pre-existing. Please, it's, it's, there's one thing I hate is just reinventing why fund your own project and your own little evaluation in your own little world? Less silos. So the next is uh, a tip called data rehearsal. Anybody heard of this? No. Yes, good, okay, level three people, I'm finally getting to you. Um, all right, so essentially, it's taking all your data, if you've had a survey or something like that, and just practicing running through to get that 
to see if your systems work. Are not, so a lot of people look at a survey and say, oh, we're, we're asking the right questions, we're okay. Where are you storing the data? Yeah, and then how are you drawing it down? Does someone on your staff know how to make an infographic out of that data? Do you know, um, can you get it from point A to point B to the final product? And does the questions that you're asking actually mirror what you need? Or do you get halfway in and go, oh, whoops. So data rehearsal is just taking those first five or 10 people. So if you know, you're doing the pregnancy diabetes, you get five or 10 results in and you just run it through and make sure you can bring it all the way from point A to point B and get that final product um, without, without saying, so, you know, you have a few young people going, going through your program in the first run. Um, they're in a wilderness program. You get the surveys and interviews back. Are you getting enough data to then make a nice final evaluation report? Or did you need to accidentally, did you need to ask them about the friends that they made on the program and you neglected to do social connection, whatever comes to mind? Okay, I'm learning the buttons, I promise. Um, Structured pyramid analysis plan. So now, anybody here from the business finance world? Mm, let's get savvy team. Okay, so I stole this from business and finance world. Um, I just did a Coursera course on it, right? So what these people do um, is they have a look at their goal, their outcome, and they'll measure it. They think about what dependent variables are that, and then what data sources can I get that from? So, yep, I, you know, let's do examples. So they might have a SMART goal. This is that same chart, the pyramid over again. Facilitate the rapid uptake of the new technology to advance WRH research. Whoa, okay, yeah, kill that. Okay, so then the next goal would be train 50 users at workshops, 20 become fully independent users, and machine usage rates are greater than 40 hours a week. Got to wonder about these medical research people, but hey, you know. Um, so the dependent variables are things like attendance at the workshops. Number of fully independent users, differentiating between those two. Number of hours a week per use. And it might be really simple that they can have sign-in sheets at the workshop and then put that in Excel spreadsheet so that they have a title like student, postdoc, research assistant, they realize. They don't have that yet, but they're working on it. Um, internal instrument usage database, counter unique user IDs. So actually looking then at who used the instrument, not just who went to the workshop, but who used the instrument. And then sign off lists of qualified independent users by the chief technician. Well, that didn't exist, but they realized they probably should have one so they could say who's fully qualified. Um, and then the next is just the internal database. So essentially what you're doing is moving from your goal, thinking about the data you want, and then actually writing down where you're going to get it. Now, this is another handout that was given to you, but it's really useful to work through this. Same again, 70% of children participating in DPIL report an increased affinity for reading. Oops, Tom. So, 70% participating in DPIL program report an increase of at least one point in their reading motivation from baseline to 12 months into the program. So affinity for reading, baseline average, whatever that is, right? Affinity for reading. I'd ask them, I said, what's affinity for reading? They're like, oh, do they like to sit on the parent's lap when they read? And I was like, well, there's probably a better way to measure that. That's lovely. Are you going to video them all reading at home? And they went, no, no, probably not. Um, so then looking at it and researching it, and there is actually, um, a habitual reading motivation, which sounds all scary. It's just five questions, but it's a, it's a reliable, valid thing that already exists that they were able to ask the parents as opposed to what they were going to ask was, does the kid sit on your lap? Yeah, and so just thinking really carefully through child's identifier, why? Because they need to follow it through 12 months later. So they need to post one 12 months later. And there I said, oh, we have all that. Oh, well, we weren't actually gonna ask them 12 month follow-up. Well, to get the 12, to get to see if there was an increase, <laughs> you would need to follow up. Oh, okay, cool. But do you see how thinking this through? At the first glance, they said, oh yeah, we're asking about affinity for reading. All they were doing on a pre-survey was saying, does the child sit on your lap when you read? This is a lot different now where they've got five questions before and after. It's not too onerous on the parents, but suddenly they're looking a lot more real to the funders. You know, a funder looking at that is gonna say, I think a lot more highly of a proposal. And then the last thing is you can use external data like the ABS, AIHW, Specialist Homelessness Services. 
anything else like that. I won't go too detailed into them. But you, if you're working with early childhood, there's the early childhood development census, there's ABS, there's AIHW has this thing called Specialist Homelessness Services Data Cubes. You can just play that give the data and you can break it down, you know, by region and you can break down by gender and you can break down by age, you can break down by mental health, you can break down the data. So if you need to say, hey, we've got a lot of this type of purchasing in this particular region, you can get that data. Um, Kessler 10 is depression and anxiety. Hilda is a, a big database around employment if you're working in employment area. And if you're working in the arts, I strongly encourage you to look at something called Culture Counts. All our grantees we fund if they're interested. And, and that is just, um, it's, it's, an, it's a tool to be able to compare, um, not compare, but to survey your theater audience or your museum visitors and learn about the compare contrast. Uh, really excellent, developed in West Australia by Practice Economics, and it's just gone wild. So everyone in Queensland, um, Western Australia, if they get DCA funding, they have access to Culture Counts. Queensland funds their folks. Victoria ran a pilot on 42 different um, arts organizations, and they all like it. So it's got traction. Um, it's newish, but it's good. It's the best I've seen. If you see anything better and you're working in the arts industry, let me know, but this is the best I've seen so far. All right. So now... We're going to move into the last bit. Yeah, I'll take about 10 minutes. We'll try to end early in case folks did have questions. So the last bit is dissemination. So I was at a meeting last week, homeless shelter in a place called Milton, doing great work. Like I can tell you they're doing great work. And they said, oh, we're so proud. We just got our evaluation back from unnamed university. We're really proud of it. We're going to have a big launch. We're very excited. I was like, super great, can I have a sneak peek? And they're like, yeah, here, here, you know, have a copy. We're going to give this out. It's like this 150-page spiral-bound monster. And I just thought, oh, that's lovely. And I actually read it cover to cover because I'm a geek and that's what I do. And it was good research in it and good research behind it. Funders, as a general rule, they, not a lot of people have their own evaluation manager. They're not going to do that. I have a friend named Christian. He works in the state government, right? He says he'll meet with someone face-to-face, -face, get a proposal from them, take that, walk down the hallway, up the lift one level, back down to his office, and that's the amount of time he reads to decide if it should be in the recycle or the to-action pile. He's in charge of a lot of money. <laughs> so it gives you a thought that that infographic or that quick talk is really important. So you take something like this, it's good to have that degree of rigor behind the research, but really thinking about, and when I say, somebody said, what's the word infographics? It's just an example of one. I really want to stress, they don't have to be perfect at first. They don't have to be perfect. Just jump in and try. But this is, um, you can see kind of, oh, okay, they're doing something with regional, 20% of, oh, it's doubling, increasing numbers hey, this is positive long-term outcomes, so 84% achieve normal or above normal speech. You get a quick picture and look at that. Um, same again. So this was another one I got back. It's a lovely table, but you almost would think the thing that they're the most proud of is the fact that they did a statistical analysis with a paired t-test. Seriously, let's have a look at this here. That's the title of the table. What? They're very they're good on them. It, it was the correct test to use. <laughs> but I think a more user-friendly version might be something like this, where you know suddenly we're looking at about 60 people who went to a finance course and um, seeing that their scores were rising. Operating at level two, but that's fine. Operate where you're operating. If you're at level one, maybe just try something at level two. Level two, just try level three. Don't worry about going in over your head, but do what you're doing well and communicate it well. Take the time to communicate it clearly your results. And again, that difference of, you know, oh, we did something scientific versus uh, this, this is the clear, quick result. Um, in terms of infographics, though, I also encourage you to look at those handouts. Because those handouts, um, I just threw on a bunch of different ones. And if you look closely, one that I think is really particularly good, because there's an example of a map and there's an example. Here, I'll, I'll just call through. So... Um, handout six is from Baker IDI, and I'm being honest, I asked, could I use it? Because it's just their first attempt. And if you look closely at it, you'll see the needles at the bottom aren't quite right, aren't quite working. Um, but they tried it, and they got the 
grant from Jack Brockoff for whom they wrote this infographic. So they were very proud. They went to a workshop, they made an infographic. It's not beautiful, but they got the grant. Okay. So my, my advice or encouragement to you is if you don't do it yet, just try. It cannot hurt and you'll only improve as you go. Um, handout 7.1 is from a social enterprise called Vanguard Laundry. And if you look at that, you can see that um, they're really clear about the number of jobs, like at, and that was last year, so we're going to update us next month, but you know, number of jobs, right now it's zero, number of people um, enrolled in education, zero. It looks like zero, but you see where they're gonna grow it to 14 to 15. Then they talk about their building, um, and they give the same fill in the blanks. So it's a bunch of almost blanks where they're showing, we want to raise 2 million, we've got 1.7 million. You see the examples really clear in a picture format. And I think the thing that, um, it's only thing I would add to improve to theirs is I would say, and to all of you, when you're doing your evaluation infographic, one or two pages, clear headline findings, don't forget the ask. Okay, so in their case, they needed a large industrial size dryer. And there's a little spot in their infographic where they could have said, you know, current, current needs and just added in industrial size dryer. But you, you want to include the ask. So this is our evaluation. Here's our project. We serve 59 young people. We did this. Um, we've got these fantastic 84% of them are reading, da, da, da. And now we need the money for another teacher. Yeah, include that ask in the infographics. This is what we did, how great we did it, and here's the ask. Um, even scientific research, same thing, environmental outcomes, you know, just really thinking through, because I think a lot of times people see the, um, I, we've done our evaluation report, here's 150 pages and then walk away. That, and that's a poor evaluator if they do that to you and you've contracted someone externally, Make sure that you include in your evaluation contract or plan that they need to give you a one or two page, not executive summary, that's all small print, nobody reads that anymore. Very trendy these days to have something um, in infographic or picture, both in philanthropic and government. And can I say in government, try to make sure it's using their language. So in Victoria, program logic, eh. but investment logic, eh. same picture underneath it, change the title. Change the title from program logic to investment logic, and suddenly you're speaking government's language. You haven't actually changed your little diagram. So just making sure you know, and I don't know, does anyone here know what the key buzz phrase is right now? Government? Words? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Found this possible, right. <laughs> Stick that at the top and submit it to the website. You hear that all over Nova these days. All right. Um, no, but do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Make sure that that language of your end game stakeholder is on the infographic. Fantastic. All right. Did anybody have any questions, including on the webinar folks? Yes. So I had a question on what your accounts might be. There's, there's about dollars to be applied to what you But where you are, a gallery or a cultural organisation, and so one of the things that you're trying to measure is the increased benefit that people have had from attending your events or activities in a social impact context. And I'm struggling to find models that I can just borrow or plagiarise or use that are applicable. And I'm wondering if you can point me in some good directions. Yeah, Culture Counts is definitely a good first step for that. So they are um, an economic modelling company, first and foremost, that has created something for small, medium and large size arts, both venues and exhibitions. And so they are asking questions and then you get the, the data back from those questions and you can use that for modeling. So I would, I would get in touch with them and talk to them and just see if they can point you in any good directions if you're looking to do, if you're looking to do it yourself, it could be worth subscribing to Culture Counts for a year, learning, seeing what they do. And then, yeah, yeah that, that would be, it's probably the, it's the approach I would take and I can't think of anyone else who does it. There's a few independent evaluation folks in Sydney who do that well, but I don't think it would be worth your budget to fly them out. To Catherine. <laughs> yeah, but something like Culture Counts, basically, they teach you, um, you know, give you the survey tools to this and that, and then you can use it on whether it's iPads or paper based, like you can use it there and then feed the data back into their system and they can help you crunch and this and that. You might have to ask them specifically about um, 
what types of return on investment like are you looking for community based yes they do that are you looking for economic and but yeah i would have a chat to them and then after a year you decide for yourself yeah what, yeah any other questions thank you very much yeah.